For the Tom Hartman Book Club today, it's Waking the Witch, Reflections on Women, Magic, and Power by Pam Grossman. This is from the introduction. Witches have always walked among us, populating societies and storyscapes across the globe for thousands of years. From Circe to Hermo Herm Hermione, from Morgan Le Fay to Marie Laveau, the witch has, all, has long existed in the tales we tell about ladies with strange powers who can harm or heal. And although people of all genders have been considered witches, it's a word that is now usually associated with women. Throughout most of history, she has someone to fear, an uncanny other who threatens our safety or manipulates reality for her own mercurial purposes. She's a pariah, a persona non grata, a boogie woman to defeat and discard. Although she's often been deemed a destructive entity, in actuality, a witchy woman has historically been far more susceptible to attack than an inflictor of violence herself. As with other terrifying outsiders, she occupies a paradoxical role in cultural consciousness as both vicious aggressor and vulnerable prey. Over the past 150 years or so, however, the witch has done another magic trick by turning from a fright into a figure of inspiration. She is now as likely to be the heroine of your favorite TV show as she is its villain. She might show up in the form of your Wiccan co-worker or the beloved musician who gives off a sorcerous vibe in videos or on stage. There's also a chance that she is you, and that witch is an identity you've taken upon yourself for any number of reasons, heartfelt or flippant, public or private. Today, more women than ever are choosing the way of the witch, whether literally or symbolically. They're floating down catwalks and sidewalks in gauzy black clothing and adorning themselves with Pinterest-worthy pentagrams and crystals. They're filling up movie theaters to watch witchy films and gathering in back rooms and backyards to do rituals, consult tarot cards, and set life-altering intentions. They're marching in the streets with Hex the Patriarchy placards and casting spells each month to try to constrain the commander-in-chief. Year after year, articles keep proclaiming it's the season of the witch as journalists try to wrap their heads around the mushro mushrooming witch trend. And all of this begs the question, why? Why do witches matter? Why are they seemingly everywhere right now? What exactly are they? And why the hell won't they go away? I get asked such things over and over, and you would think that after a lifetime of studying and writing about witches, as well as hosting a witch-themed podcast and being a practitioner of witchcraft myself, my answers would be succinct. In fact, I find that the more I work with the witch, the more complex she becomes. Hers is a slippery spirit, Try to pin her down and she'll only recede further into the dark, deep wood. I do know this for sure, though. Show me your witches and I'll show you your feelings about women. The fact that the resurgence of feminism and the popularity of the witch are ascending at the same time is no coincidence. The two are reflections of each other. That said, this current witch wave is nothing new. I was a teen in the 1990s, the decade that brought us such pop o culture as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Charmed, and The Craft. Not to mention Riot Girls and third wave feminists who taught me that female power could come in a variety of colors and sexualities. I learned that women could lead a revolution while wearing lipstick and combat boots, and sometimes even a cloak. But my own witchly awakening came at an even earlier age. Morganville, New Jersey, where I was raised, was a solidly suburban town, but it it retained enough natural land features back then to still feel a little bit scruffy in spots. We had a small patch of woods in our backyard that abutted a horse farm, and the two were separated by a wisp of running water that we could cross via a plank of wood. When we were little, my older sister Emily and I would sometimes venture to the other side where we could feed the horses, an act that still scares me to this day, and pick fistfuls of clover. But the majority of our time was spent on our side of the stream, threading ourselves through the thicket of trees that served as our personal forest. In one corner of the yard, a giant puddle would form whenever it rained, surrounded by a border of ferns. We called this spot our magical place. That it would vanish and then reappear only added to its mystery. It was a portal to the unknown. These woods are where I first remember doing magic. 
entering that state of deep play where imaginative action becomes reality. I would spend hours out there creating rituals with rocks and sticks, drawing secret symbols in the dirt, losing all track of time. It was a space that felt holy and wild, yet still strangely safe. As we age, we're supposed to stop, we're supposed to stop filling our heads with such nonsense. Unicorns are to be traded in for Barbie dolls, though both are mythical creatures to be sure. We lose our tooth fairies, walk away from our wizards. Dragons get slain on the altar of our youth. Most kids grow out of their magic phase. I grew further into mine. My grandma Trudy was a librarian at the West Long Branch Library, which meant I got to spend many a long afternoon lurking between the 001.9 and 135 Dewey Decimal sections reading about Bigfoot and dream interpretation in Nostradamus, Waking the Witch by Pam Grossman.